this time. John chapter 13 is where we are. This is Labor Day weekend, and I was trying to come up with something to share, and I was led to this passage, however reason I was there. And it's so fitting. Jesus had accomplished his work, and he had one more thing to do, and that was a big thing, to pay the price for our sin, but he acknowledged the fact that he had done, been faithful to where he was, and he was ready to depart. John chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Father, as we look into these few verses, there is so much we can glean from them. Help us to see the need of relaxing in what you have provided and what you've prepared and how you've equipped us and the responsibilities that we have. There are so many opportunities before us, and we're not quite sure when we will see you, but we're to be diligent to the end. Help us to take that admonition in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in John chapter 13, and as I listen to radio advertisements on the way home, and they, when they put them on, they were talking about preparing for your final arrangements and your funeral, and when your time has come, and when that time comes, and it got me thinking about that kind of stuff. And, and then I looked in John chapter 13, and I want to give it the title of Logging Out. Put it in a computer type conversation. And look how far, as we celebrate this Labor Day, look how far things have come in the years that have gone by. Do you know, realize how much easier it is to communicate to, with someone? Years ago, before the cell phone and before the internet, you would await that letter that someone hand wrote you and come to the mailbox and prior to all those things. And to think about it, you know, that there are several nations that don't even have mail service, but yet they can get a text instantly. And the, the technology, how things have become a lot easier. How about in the realm of even mowing your yard? You ever, it, I'd add a Z, I used a zero turn once and about took my life in my own hands. But nonetheless, those of you that have flat lawns and use those things know how fast that can happen. Back in the day when we were learning how to mow the lawn, we had this piece of junk lawn mower that you literally wrap the string around the, I guess it's the crank that makes the whole thing go. And when you pull it, 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 when it didn't start. You get the tide again and wrap it around and pull it. You know, that's before the string would even retract. And you know, I'm talking, those of you that push the real mower really know what I'm talking about. But how things have become much more easier. How about drawing hot water out of the spigot versus having people to heat it up on the stove? But in the advancement, we might have lost some things, but we live in this culture of technology. We're in electronic and digital things. And, and I have to say, I appreciate it. When we were in college, there were no such things as computers that you could type out your report and spell check things and it would correct stuff for you and you could get into a lot of trouble with a misspelled word in when we wrote theology papers. In fact, when you wrote a theology paper, you typed it out. Typewriters are almost obsolete, but they're not very fair to us guys because I have to type out a marriage license. And you know, I have one typewriter that I think I'm on the last ribbon and I hope that I can get another ribbon because I've got to type one today. And if it don't turn out, I'm going to be in a heap of hurt. Maybe some of you have a typewriter that works really good. I might have to borrow it or bring my paperwork to you. But as we, these changes happen, when we wrote theology papers, if we misspelled a word, you got an F immediately. 
I didn't even get past the title page. <laughs> there was a big circle that I misspelled the title and I got an F and I, it was not good. But let me tell you, things have advanced, but we're into this text here of when we log out. And on these computers, when you go to shut down, you, you can log off. It asks the question sometimes, do you want to save the changes you have made? Are you sure you want to continue logging off? And you know, that brings you food for thought. Are you ready to log off? Have you finished the work that you wanted to do? Are you okay with what's there because you're going to leave it and it's going to be done? This is where we are in the setting. Was Jesus okay that his time to log off was coming? Yes. Verse 1, and I draw from that is the acknowledgement. He knew the exit plan. He knew that his hour had come, the first part of verse 13. We were in the marriage miracle at Canaan in chapter 2 of John this morning in Sunday school. And he said to his mother, my hour has not yet come. And it's obviously more than 60 minutes. The hour was that portion or that arena of that part of their life. More than just a 60 minute segment. The hour of temptation is more than one hour when it talks about those kinds of things. But it is a time period or that time in your life. His hour to start his public ministry in his eyes had not yet come. But his mother must have been in better tune with the father or perhaps was understanding that yes, it is your time. And Jesus did something about it. But nonetheless, he acknowledged it and went with it. Now he knows that his hour has come, that he should depart from that world. He was in the upper room with the disciples, and he, they had had the Last Supper. And he basically is ready to give them a whole lot of instructions, and you'll see that in the following chapters. He's going to instruct them the importance of following the Holy Spirit's leading, and how that we need him in our life, and a bunch of other things. But the exit plan he was aware of, his hour of death was coming. Do you know I still think that some people can sense that. They know when it's that time that they'll be going. I think of that whenever there's several people in this congregation that I've been with them or with their families when their loved one realized it was their time to be going. And you know God can reveal that however he sees fit to do that. But Jesus knew that his time was come that he would be leaving the earth. The exit plan, the eternal place, where was he going? When he should depart from this world, where? To the Father. Do you know what? As believers, we can say the same thing. When we get to leave this world, we're departing to the Father. Our logging off, that's a really, as believers, that is a consolation that a lot of people don't have. And when they don't have that, they are scared off the times and they're in the unknown. But having known the fact that he's going to the Father, that eternal place, the third part of that is the encouragement that's provided. The encouraging words he gives is he has loved his own who were in the world and he loves them to the end. He finished what he was called to do. Isn't there a something in that feeling of accomplishment? We're having Labor Day. I don't even know why they call it that. Labor, well, I know why they call it that. Because that's usually when we're catching up on all of our chores. But Labor Day was given to us to relax from our labors. A day off. And the feeling of accomplishment. Do you ever start a project and it was a big project and finally when you put that last brick in the wall or that last paint on the wall or whatever you're working on, that final touch on a, whatever project you are, there's that feeling of accomplishment. Wow, I finished what I was intending to do. And Jesus would have had that same sense in this verse where he says, I, I, he had loved his own who were in the world. And not only did he love them, he loved them to the end. He never gave up. It's too soon to quit. There's a one up poster on the wall in my office back here and one at home of a frog that's grabbing a hold of the neck of his pelican or whatever that's trying to eat it. And it's too soon to ever quit. Never give up. You know, take another step. If you don't quit, you, you, you never get across the finish line if you quit. So keep going till you're done. Too many people die before they're done living. You know, they give up. 
They just, or they quit living before they die, however you want to word that. They just give up too soon. If you're here, you're here for a purpose. Do what that purpose is. So he performed his work to the end. The acknowledgments given in verse 1, he knew the time was coming and he was pre prepared to go. Let me tell you, every one of us in the room have a time that's coming. We better be prepared. And my only preparation, main important preparation, is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. But bigger than that, you want to accomplish what he has you here for. That your children's children might understand the way of eternal life. And that you have, you know, your life in accordance to his will and his way. The acknowledgments, the adversaries in verse 2. And that was when the devil was tempting Judas to betray Christ. And supper being ended, the devil having put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Where do your evil thoughts come from? The devil. Is he done doing that? Does no one in this place ever gets an evil thought, right? Wrong. He sends them to us all the time. And it's not always something horrendous. It could be, you don't need to do that. You don't need to read your Bible. Why do you only, only super Christians do that? You don't need to pray. You don't need to encourage. So he gives you all these lies, and then he gives you evil thoughts. Oh, you ought to steal that. Oh, you ought to tell the, an untruth. You ought, he does those things, but you know what we got to do? We got to bring those thoughts into captivity and filter them through the filter of God's word and see if it's of God or if it's of the devil. And he'll tempt, he tempted Jesus in the wilderness to do miracles that he didn't need to do because he was God. And, you know, he'll tempt anybody to do anything but you know what you can resist it if you draw near to God and that's just the way that that is so you have the devil who was willing to do his interrupt anything that is good and that's what he's good at but you have he identifies Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus but knowing this in verse 3 you not only do you have an acknowledgement and an adversary you have assurances given to Jesus verse 3 Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, first thing, the provisions of the Father. Do you know that God has given us everything we need to live the Christian life? What has he given us? Well, start with the Holy Spirit of God himself, who resides within us. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost? So we have this treasure in our earthen vessels, which is none other than the person of the Holy Spirit. And he is busy doing all kinds of wonderful things because he is wonderful. He is counselor. He is, prince, he is a prince of peace. He is the comforter. He is the one who leads you in paths of right. Everything good is from him. And he is there doing a marvelous work in your life. If you don't see him or know that he's at work, you've got a problem. Because you ought, when you try, when the devil brings that temptation to you, what's the first thing you get? Conviction. I don't need to do that. Or I shouldn't. That's just what happens whenever that light dispels darkness. So we have everything provided by the Father. And my God shall supply all your needs. He knows if you need emotional support. He knows if you need financial help. He knows if you need physical healing. He knows if you need comfort. He knows if you need refreshment. He knows you better than you know you. And he loves you more than anybody else does. So you can relax in that. The provisions of the Father. That's the first thing that he recognizes. The second thing is where he came from. And that he had come from God. The position in the family. As believers in Christ, where are we in that portfolio? In the family photo. You are right there. There's the father. You are his child. Don't you put your kids in the family photo. You are right there with him. What are you? They're trophies of his grace. You're only in his family by the grace of God. You're not there because you're so smart or because you're so good or because you're so giving. You're there because you accepted the grace that he offers you and the forgiveness of your sin. And he gives you that eternal life. So he had come from God. Not only does he acknowledge the position in the family, he acknowledges the promise of the future. Where was he going? His first step was Calvary, but 
inevitably he was going to God. And he endured Calvary knowing what was coming because his love for us to the end. He could see the end of the story. We can't. We only have that little bit of picture that we get through the scriptures of what heaven's like. And then our mind can only conceive certain things. You draw conclusions. Do you ever draw a conclusion of what someone might look like by basis of what they sound like? Or We draw these perceptions. I can't even imagine what heaven looks like, nor can you. Streets of gold. I mean, I got a little gold piece in a box that I have to give away this afternoon that probably costs six, seven hundred dollars, and it's like this big. What about streets paved? They're doing a lot of tar and chipping here. You notice all that? Every road in the county that isn't dug up is tarred and chipped. But you have all this stuff happening. Can you imagine if they were paving with gold? There'd be a lot of thieves out there. There wouldn't be none of them in heaven. There'd be a lot of guys collecting the residue, but that's not how it is. But you know that he's going to God. Only our, we can only imagine what he has prepared for us. The assurances don't miss the fact that you have the provisions of the Father, you have a position in the family. You have a promise in the future. You can't beat that. You are good here and there. Last thing he admonishes us to do, and I stopped at verse 4 on purpose because we would have been a long time here if I'd have kept going to what he did. And you can do that for homework whenever you have time that you're not working tomorrow and you're sitting there drinking your lemonade under the shade tree or whatever you're doing. But he tells what how he, he gets into a dialogue with Peter and, you know, the disciples as he washes their feet. But that's what he was going to do in verse 4. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Who did those kinds of things? Servants. He didn't come to be Lord over, he came to serve. And he came to be, yeah, our Lord and Savior, but he came to serve and to give his life for those that he loved. So the two things I drew out of verse 4 is that we should do likewise. We need to choose humility. He didn't have to do that. He chose to lay aside his garments. He, had, he could have wore kingly vesture because he's king of kings and lord of lords. But he came in humility. Why was he born in a stable in Bethlehem? The very act of humility. And you know, that, doesn't, that should be an admonition to us. We are nothing apart from the grace of God. We are only anything because of what is within us. So choose humility when you're tempted to be proud. When you're looking for that accolade or that acknowledgement, allow the glory to go to the Father. And allow him to receive that. So he put on humility for what reason? To serve others. Took a towel and girded himself. And then the next verse goes on to say that he went to serve others. And as I listened to some guys preaching last week, Greg Glory was sort of in the passage. When he was dealing with Peter, when, you know, Peter says, I'll never deny you. And that's where pride was in his heart. In the end, the Lord said, yeah, you will. You'll deny me three times. You know, now that you brought it up, mister. Don't let pride destroy you. Pride leads to destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Be careful with that. Choose humility and serve others. What did Jesus do throughout his life other than serve others? That's what he did. That is the Father's will. And you know, when you do the Father's will and you labor for Him, that's concluding the message with 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord? It's beyond going to church. It reaches into the community. It reaches into your neighbor. It reaches into your loved one. It reaches into that person in distress. It's not prejudice. You're just showing the love of Christ to a world that is lost. That is what it is, the work of the Lord, that you knowing that your work in the Lord is not labor in vain. When you serve, the, it could be you're sitting behind a desk answering telephone calls. You're still serving Him. Remember that, and you're representing the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are in His family, 
And it is our duty to make our Heavenly Father look good and to give Him the glory for what He's done in our life. So as you log out, I hope that you'll want to save the changes, the changes that He has made in your life. And you know, if there's some things you need to delete or correct, now's the time. Take that action. You know, if you want to, something to be different, do it now before you log off. None of us know when we're logging off. We don't have the expiration date written on us. We don't know that. But we do know we all have that appointment with Him. And we stand with, before Him. We want to hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. A labor that is not in vain. It is worth it all. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love to us. Help us to be as prepared to die as you were, that you were completely satisfied by who you are, where you were headed, and what the Father has allowed you to do. Help us to have those same confidences as we face the end of our journey, whenever that may be. And if it were today, could we say that we're not ashamed and that we're ready, and we don't need to make any changes, that we could accept that. If there's any changes we need to make, help us to take action even this hour and to make all things new and to change the dynamics and the way that we live life. Our perspective and outlook and our compassion on others are so important. Give us a great day, we pray, and we'll give you the honor, glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.